This is a production of WTVI PBS Charlotte. A local man pleads guilty to attempting to support terrorists. Plus, the Hagen Tilla showdown could be the nation's most expensive Senate race. And how long will the fans' love affair with the Hornets last? Those stories and more on this Off the Record. Good evening, I'm Jeff Rivenbart. Great to have you with us. My guests this week include Tom Bullock with WFAE, Jim Morrill with the Charlotte Observer, Jamie Bowl with WBTV News 3, and B. Thompson with WBAV. It's great to have each of you with us today. Mm -hmm. Disturbing news out of Rowan County, 44-year-old Donald Ray Morgan pleaded guilty Thursday to attempting to provide support to a foreign terrorist organization and possession of a firearm by a felon. Court documents say between January and August of this year, Morgan tried to provide support and resources to al-Qaeda in Iraq, also known as the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, known as ISIL, and the Islamic State of Iraq and al-Sham, known as ISIS. So what's disturbing to me this morning is the fact that this this guy was a Rowan County special deputy. He worked in the jail and the courts, and he was even a police officer with the East Spencer Police mm -hmm. Department. Jamie, I know you guys were following this this week. It should give you pause, uh, shouldn't it? And it goes, I think, to the point of do we really ever know our neighbors? Obviously, this was a gentleman. You see the pictures of him in his little league uniform, mm -hmm. you know, as a child, and seems like you know every kid in any town USA. Obviously, some things happened in his life that, that made him take a turn and the propaganda that is out there. Uh, he converted to Islam at some point after some troubles in his relationship, and he got sucked in uh, by this propaganda that's out there. And it doesn't isn't just this. We've seen it in other situations. We see the young man out out west uh, mm -hmm. near Seattle who became a, a problems with some issues in his life. He took a turn, took a gun, and did some yeah. things. Thankfully, in this case, that didn't happen. Um, law enforcement tracked him, found him before anything serious came of it. And, and this reminds me a lot of when we hear about murders. Uh, you know, we kind of get tired of the sound bites on TV where I didn't know this would ever happen in my neighborhood. It's kind of the same thing because I think we fall into this mindset of thinking, oh, these little renegade folks are like in other parts of the country in, you know, Seattle, out west or wherever. But they're actually right here among us. Well, and those renegade folks are exactly, they really are the biggest fear for, you know, the American security forces. And I mean, the, the U.S. government is worried about it. Homeland Defense is worried, or, you know, the Department of Homeland Security is worried about it because these folks, they're not, there aren't a whole lot of them. They're, they, there's not, they're not dangerous in numbers, but single people that have American passports that can get trained, go back and forth, that is clearly what they fear because it's a lot easier for an American, no matter what the cause, no matter what they're angry at, to carry out some kind of an attack here in America than it is for a foreigner now to get in and to do something. And, you know, when it comes to recruiting, it's also just a, a sign of how effective the propaganda coming from ISIS is. You know, you can talk about, you talk about the folks in Seattle. Right. Um, they're the, the three girls from Denver. Mm -hmm. We have this gentleman from the Carolinas. There are others that are out there. And, you know, they're very good at targeting people uh, with propaganda to give them some kind of a sense of purpose or something in their life that is attractive enough that they're willing to go over and try to get trained, go over and take part in, you know, the Syrian civil war, or potentially do something here. Well, Tom, I, I have to agree with you on that, because when you give someone a purpose in their life or give them power or you validate what they think is right, then that makes them want to do even more. But I had mentioned to you gentlemen earlier, to me, America, we've had homegrown terrorists for quite some time. Mm -hmm. Starts with the KKK. We've had training camps in different states. There have been KKK training camps right here in North Carolina. Difference being, they said under my American right, I can do this. And they do have a right to assemble and to do some things. Now with this terrorist thing, America looks at other countries and people who would be from this country to support someone else and say, we have to get them. But terrorism, whether domestic or foreign, has been with us all the time. We're more attuned to it now because it is terrorism that is rampant and does not have mercy on anyone. When you have a terrorist organization that encourages people to go cut other people's heads off, that's something Americans are like, wait a minute, we shoot people, we don't cut their heads off. But the whole thing is still terrorism, but it's a form that we're not used to, and it strikes terror in people because they don't know as we've all said mm -hmm. around this table, who would be the next person? 
Is it the person who lives next door to you who was always quiet and mild-mannered and all of a sudden validation has been given to that individual that we support you and we want you to come and help with our particular belief? And you they know, do. You, you know, when I hear stories like this, it reminds me of Jim Jones and, um, you know, mm-hmm. all the people that he was able to get to follow him to Guyana, Africa. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a lot of times, uh, you know, they're really targeting these folks who are having problems in their life. And clearly in this guy's case, I think he had a divorce and probably lost his stature with the police departments he was working with. And, um, you know, life started unraveling a little bit. And that seems to be an easy prey for someone to be swayed to maybe kind of go into these renegade type activities. I think it's a fair comparison, but I think, um, I mean, B, you're right. You know, it's easy for us to visualize the terrorists or people who come from over there to attack us here. But, you know, besides things like the KKK, um, how about Timothy McVeigh? Mm -hmm. You know, how about the gentleman who was just caught up in Pennsylvania after shooting at two officers, killing one of them? Mr. Eric Freen. Yeah. I mean, the fact of the matter is domestic terrorism is a long history, and we don't necessarily see it as being the same branch of terrorism mm-hmm. or perhaps as you know fearful we're not as fearful of that terrorism but it's still terrorism it's, and i'm sorry it's not just terrorist either i mean it's like those uh kids at the school outside seattle last mm-hmm. week uh, they had no yeah. idea this kid with a gun the kid that they uh, that they all knew and, and who invited them to in. lunch right yeah. right well let's turn our attention now to the election we're just a few days away a new elon university poll shows democratic senator Kay hagan with a slight lead over republican tom tillis the poll released thursday shows 44.7 percent of likely voters backing hagan while 40.7 percent support tillis the margin of error is about 3.75 percentage points but there are two other polls published this week that show the candidates are tied in what has become the nation's most expensive senate race and it looks like all eyes will be on this race come Tuesday night. Well, you know, they've already said nationally in order to flip the Senate, the Republicans need to pick up six seats. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's a possibility of that. Even with the U.S. House, which they already have control, it would still be kind of like this. And uh, if they didn't pick up all that they needed, Vice President, who is a Democrat, could be the deciding vote if they had to come to a vote. But to me, in this whole race and everything that we've heard, all the commercials, all the signs, everything on social media, the biggest thing as voters you should be concerned about and what should scare you is that if this campaign has spent already $100 million on commercials and trying to convince you, what scares me is 70% of that money came from outside of North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Now stop and think about it. That means there are a lot of folk who are trying to control what happens in this state. Not just your vote, but control ultimately. We see it not only with the senatorial race, we're seeing it with the judicial races, Mm -hmm. where judges can't really tell you how they feel one way or the other, but now in rides another outside group within the last week, less than a week, and starts making statements about our judicial system. And you need to look at who's running for the Supreme Court in North Carolina, who's running for the local judge's position. Educate yourself and find out. Don't just depend on ads and signs. That's your responsibility. You got one little vote. Make sure it counts for the people you want to elect and not for the people who come into the state to determine who you should elect. That's what concerns me, that that much money and somebody still needs to go back to the Supreme Court about money and how it can be spent and who's a pack and who is not and how they can come and influence Disclosures vote. Disclosures of, of who these donors it are needs to be you know, there. and all these things. Just wait uh, in two years when we have a governor's exactly. race, a Senate race, wow. and a presidential, and a presidential race. race. So uh, if you think it's been bad, uh, this election cycle, yeah. hold We're on, because up. it's going to be crazy. I, I think the race was a lot closer than that poll you cited. Uh, you know, uh, other polls uh, have shown it to be uh, neck and neck, which I think it is. You know, and I think we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that it is what you said, the most expensive race in the country. Not only is it the most expensive race in the country, but it's the most expensive Senate race ever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we've seen more ads in this race than I think anybody's ever seen, over 100,000. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's, it's in a class by itself. I, I've noticed that in previous campaigns, it's almost like I can, I've memorized the ads and I kind of know, okay, well, I know where this ad is headed. 
this time around, it seems like the ads are coming out fresh every week or every couple of days. Mm -hmm. and, and the ads that I remember from two or three months ago, I don't even know if I've even seen them recently. I think it was the Clinton campaign, right? It was sort of the rap rapid reaction. Anything, something yep. happened, you saw something, them immediately try to get out yeah. in, in front of it. And that's just become the norm now yeah. in politics. If one thing is said on the campaign trail after the debate, uh, the Hagan admission about missing the hearing, boy, that was in a spot the very next day. Uh, these, these folks are good at this. This is what they do. Does it make us better informed? voters? Probably not. Uh, when we watched the debates, all we saw, quite honestly, was them regurgitating the 30-second mm -hmm. ads over and over, and it was really tough to get them off a talking point and to get them to actually tell us, what would you do on a vote like this? And I think that becomes the frustrating uh, part for the electorate, it's just know, getting something out of them. What you know, Jamie, their handlers have told them, yep. stay on point. Because they know that it's going to turn up in a 30-second exactly. spot. As yeah. soon stay as they on don't. point. And exactly. not only that, but they, they control their public events, too. You know, like uh, Senator yes. Hagan's events uh, most recently in Charlotte are ticketed. You have to apply for a ticket. They're very afraid of, of trackers from the other campaign mm -hmm. coming with video cameras, you know, nailing them on whatever embarrassing gap they might make. Uh, right. So they're, up, they're both paranoid about it. I want to be interesting to see because I will say for Senator Burr, he's been known to sort of drive around on his own yeah. with a lot of sick people around him. When he's up for election in two years, I'm going to be fascinated to see how much of that he can hold on to. My suspicion is probably not much, yeah. Uh, yeah. but it'll be interesting to watch because uh, it has changed dramatically. I, I have to make mention, all, of, all three of you have also said about um, two years from now, when we've got all of these other elections mm -hmm. that are happening, if you're looking at some of these commercials, we're already seeing commercials from people who expect to run for something two years from now, mm -hmm. and they're here in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And sure. uh, they're trying to feel it out. And these are the folks who are saying, this commercial was not endorsed by any candidate or any party. No, but it's you're putting something out there to people to know your name. And I'm speaking specifically about Ben Carson, okay? Technically, he is Dr. Ben Carson. But do you know anything about this man? No. And now he's doing ads here about certain topics to get his name out there. It's like, uh, I, I suspect this is going to be a Republican candidate. Uh, you, you couldn't get Powell, Colin Powell. So find somebody else who was pretty good at pulling up bootstraps and has some credibility. And maybe we can use that one and we'll, we'll get these other votes. But we're already seeing those commercials. And it's endorsed by a man who is not a declared candidate for anything but he's spending a lot of money in this state already. Mm -hmm. Pay attention to where the money's coming from. Mm -hmm. I want to continue our conversation about the election rhetoric. I mean, you simply can't go anywhere without being bombarded with campaign messages along the highway, ads on radio and TV, flyers showing up in your mailbox, even your home computer. And I noticed, I think one night this week, I was on Facebook or something, and I saw an ad popping up asking me if I had voted. And I'm thinking... Well, yes, I have, you know, and I'm looking to see who sent me this ad. My intern even mentioned she was watching YouTube videos the other day and saw ads popping up. Where are some of the unusual places you've seen the ads this campaign season? And is it a little bit invasive, or is it just part of what we should expect from now on? It's reality. It's a big data world, isn't it? Yeah, that's exactly yeah. it. You're exactly right. I mean, there was a time, we were talking about this before the show, there was a time, it was back when Howard Dean was running, that using the internet and you know starting to do micro-targeting was so cutting edge that it was, I, I mean, people sat there watching his campaign thinking, this is amazing and it's the future. Well, the future's here. You know, there's so much money that's rolling around. There's so much at stake, as they love to say. Well, really what it is, is, you know, midterm elections are tricky. There are drop-off voters. Historically, turnout is incredibly low in comparison to presidential years. So they will bombard you any and every single way that they can. So, you know, you're going to see it pop up. You know, the door hangers, we've all come to expect. Robocalls, I haven't seen as, or heard as many here, but I think that's because most people don't have landlines anymore and it's harder mm -hmm. to track cell phones. But internet, you know, no matter what the site, no matter where you go, whether you're shopping or reading for news, should expect it. And it will only get worse as 2016 rolls around. And some of those things, I mean, I'm always amazed at where you, you were talking about Drudge Report. Mm -hmm. yeah. You see ads for Hagen. You see ads for Hagen on uh, conservative websites like the Drudge Report or Breitbart or something like that. And, and conversely, you see Tillis ads on, on liberals, liberal sites. Mm -hmm. It's just uh, kind of a paradox, but it just shows you the ubiquity, ubiquity of 
all these online mm -hmm. ads. I've been a bit surprised about the Twitter presence <laughs> yeah. of the Tom Tillis campaign. Yeah. I have seen far more Twitter activity based on, on him or his surrogates than I have, it seems like, with the Hagen and, and the Democrats uh, on that side. I also find it interesting, Sean Hawes, the Libertarian candidate, suddenly you're getting these ads pop up quite frequently in my Twitter timeline, I'm not sure why this is, about uh, legalization <laughs> of marijuana. Um, but. You know, that was an ad that's not paid for by Sean Haw. That is an ad being paid for by a Republican. Freedom partner. Yeah, yep. exactly. Yeah. Right. And trying to drive up support, perhaps to siphon off a few votes uh, from Kay Hagan. So it's fascinating. The strategies behind all this. Well, things. I think trying to overwhelm us with all of this advertising to get voters, we might as well call this the shock and awe campaign <laughs> because it is inundating us. It is so much and it's becoming overwhelming. And at some point we're past the point of saturation but you keep throwing it at us anyway. And you're gonna reach a tipping point where people are like, you know what, if I hear one more fill in the name commercial, I'm never gonna vote for that person. And, and I think you can have backlash like that, mm -hmm. particularly when we see so much coming in and you're acting as if voters are absolutely stupid, mm -hmm. that we don't have any way of figuring out who we think will best represent us. So you have to bring in all of these folk from someplace else to buy ads to convince us of who is best. Now, by putting at the end of the commercial not endorsed by any candidate or any party, that allows that candidate to say, I didn't do it. You know, they, they mm -hmm. came in and did that on their own. But I still have questions about folks who try to say, I, I didn't do it. You had to tell them, well, we don't mind if you want to come spend some money on this campaign because it gives them even more airtime for the public. I want to revisit something we talked about last week on the show, and it was the Mecklenburg County sales use tax referendum. If approved, the county sales tax will go up by a quarter cent. Our, our sales tax would then be 7.5 percent in Mecklenburg County. Now, we're being told most of the money would be used for CMS teacher salaries. Some will go to public libraries, Central Piedmont Community College, and the Arts and Science Council. But you know what? It's interesting. When I did early voting two days ago, and I grabbed the sample ballot when I left, there are just, I counted it up, there are 24 words that describe what I just told you. And my question to you is, are voters going to know enough about this measure to vote for or against it? And I would tend to think many would probably just bypass it because they see the word tax. And tax thought? without explanation means you want more of my money, and I would say no. But the explanation gives people a reason to say yes. But Mark Garrison made a very good point on the show last week that that tax could be changed. Mm -hmm. If you get a different yeah. city council, council is going to say education is the bailiwick of county government. They're supposed to provide the money in the state. We're not supposed to. Well, we've got this quarter penny tax. A future council could possibly say we can use that for something else because if they didn't want to go up on property tax, mm -hmm. or this you've council, already got that penalty, this council could that do money the same and thing. do it. So how do you assure voters if you're saying we're going to use that money to help people in education, keep some of those teachers and help right. other staff members? But if down the line you get another council that says, you know what, that really isn't our responsibility, but we do have authorization to collect that tax, so we're going to continue to do it and we'll use it for something else. What makes me know that you're not going to play bait and switch later on if we approve a tax? Are you saying people don't trust government? Around well, you know, every now and then you need to <laughs> check that, that, around that, that, the edges yeah, and that, make sure they're doing what they're supposed to do. That they might change their mind somewhere down the road. That is yeah. the concern. You're right. And uh, it'll be interesting to see. Uh, there's been quite a bit of reporting on it, so I think people understand the issue. But like to your point, if... Uh, you go into the polling post and you're just looking for this very simple question. That's not what you're going to find. Mm -mm. Um, and we'll see if people can sort it out and whether it'll pass. And it is that whole issue. This is supposed to be a state responsibility. And so now what happens to outlying areas? But, you know, I think it was maybe it was an Observer article, you know, pointing out that these teachers, uh, some of them got the 7% average raise. Some didn't get any. And if they can go get a job in the Rock Hill School District and make ten grand more for doing the exact same job, uh, how does Mecklenburg stay competitive? Um, and it's a business recruiting issue. Uh, it's it's a lot at stake on this on this important ballot issue. And who could blame them too? I mean, right? Of course, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and also to that point, uh, on the Charlotte ballot, that is, if you're a Charlotte voter, there are three other um, referenda or measures that you also have to vote on. I think we were talking about this earlier. I think I'm a pretty intelligent guy, and I prepared before I went in to vote. But even with all of my preparation and pulling out my notes out of my pocket so I would remember who to vote for, there were still surprises on this ballot that took me 
um, for a surprise. And, and I really felt I didn't do my homework before I went in to vote. Um, one of those issues we were talking about is the Constitution Amendment on the ballot. Uh, when you go to vote, um, it, this ballot, uh, this, this measure hasn't really gotten a lot of attention, but it's a proposed change to the state constitution. The amendment would allow a criminal defendant to have his right to trial by jury waived as long as the state is not seeking the death penalty. Do you think folks know enough about these issues before they go in? We don't even know enough about the judges, much less about yeah. the issue in changing a a constitutional amendment to North Carolina's constitution. This is getting a little thick in there, and I have to wonder who was backing putting that on this ballot in the first place, because the public doesn't really know it. So if, is it a group of people in the legal field, the judicial field, who is backing a change to the constitution concerning when you go to court, whether or not you have a jury trial or a judge simply sentences you. That's a concern to me mm -hmm. because judicial system has an impact on a lot of people. You can set precedent in a case that affects people in the future. So who's backing that? And why didn't you tell the people it was gonna be on this ballot? Yeah, it, and, and this is funny, I mean, the, the term is a bench trial. And basically the, the way that this amendment would work is it would al allow a defendant to choose whether or not, and they would actually have the power to do it, whether or not to have a jury trial or a bench trial. Mm -hmm. And there are all kinds of reasons to go for both. You can go for a bench trial, let's say, if it's really complicated, if you, you know, or frankly, if it's such an unseemly case that you think that there's no way in, in the world a jury is going to find for you. I mean, a, you know, a judge can be a little bit more... Uh, I'm trying to think of the right term here, legal. Uh, they'd, they'd go for the law as opposed to the emotion, emotion. that they, a exactly jury right. would Thank right. you. But there are also other, there's a flip side to that. It's, you know, you can become prone to judge shopping, trying to make sure that you yeah. have someone who is going to find for you. What about defendants? What about, you know, basically are they going to be pressured if all of a sudden it's like, well, we can do a, a bench trial, which takes, they take a lot less time, they cost a lot less money for the state. We can do that in a matter of days or weeks. If it's a jury trial, you're going to be sitting here for, you know, months or longer. Um, it's it's interesting that no one has said much about this. Exactly. And it's really something that can make a big difference when it comes to, you know, court cases in the judicial system. And instead. who's going to jail? It can mm -hmm. make a major difference because if you find that a judge may send someone to jail for a short amount of time, a jury might send you for a long amount of time, your attorney may say go for the judge. But... Mm -hmm then we're still talking about how many people are going to jail or is this fair? A jury may say, I, I don't think that's fair that they want to send this person to jail, but my biggest concern is why hasn't this been talked about more and who was backing it to put it on the ballot in the first place? I should point out, I think 49 other states already do it this way. Yeah, we're the we're, outlier. We're the right. outlier in this, so it would just put us in line uh, with the rest of, of the country. I did have a conversation with uh, Superior Court Judge Boner uh, just this week, and he pointed that out, thinks it's a no-brainer as far as that this should be done and this should be an option. Um, we did a story, we did do a story this week, uh, Chris Fialco, the attorney, famously, I guess, now representing a Greg Hardy in his domestic mm -hmm. violence case, uh, pointed out that this is a solution in search of a problem. There really isn't one going on right now, so he's kind of against it. And he's, to your point, saying, well, does this concentrate a, a lot of power then in judges' hands? Exactly. And, and that was his concern about it. But like I said, 49 other states are already doing this. It just puts us in line with everyone else. Yeah, but just because everybody does it, as my mama <laughs> would say, that doesn't mean you're supposed to do it. Does right. it make sense? Does it meet what the people need? And that's what it's supposed to be about. What are the needs of the people? Not of the system, but of the people. Does it really meet the need? I think you're going to see with that, what you're going to see with a lot of these races, a big drop off in voting. You know, mm -hmm. uh, everybody, or unless you're sick and tired of the Senate race, you're going to vote in the Senate race. But beyond that, on, you're, you're yeah. going to have a lot of people not vote on a lot of these things, especially the judges and some of these questions. Do you think we, the media, should be doing a better job of not just focusing on the, the Hagen-Tillis race? We know that's very important but to be delving more into some of these other issues. And clearly you guys have done that. WFAE, I know this week, and, and, and even the Charlotte Observer. Should we be doing more to try to bring more awareness to some of these other issues? I think we're doing what we can. Yeah, you do what you can. I mean, honestly, going back to, to B's point and this specific constitutional amendment, go out on the website or go on mm -hmm. Google and try to find somebody who is either for or against it. Mm -hmm. it it's almost impossible. I mean, you really have to, to dig in ways, it, it's, it's like a stealth amendment. Well, and the voter has to take some responsibility in all this, right? I, agree. I mean, if you can't find the information, you're not trying. Yeah. Um, it's all out there somewhere. 
Um, and some of it gets difficult when we talk about the campaign financing of it all, that part, and who's behind some of these things, but the true issues themselves. Uh, it's out there to be found, and you do need to do a little bit of homework and try to be a, a higher information voter as you head in to tackle the ballot that can be complicated. Well, you know, my thing has always been, please stop accepting information from people three minutes before you go in there to cast your ballot as <laughs> people are stuffing things in your hand as right. you're going in. There's not that much time and the lines won't be that long. So you've got maybe three to five minutes to try to decipher 15 pieces of information somebody just put in your hand yeah. as you're walking in. Don't do that because you're not going to make an intelligent decision. You've got time now. This show mm -hmm. is coming on long before the election to research the candidates and make your decision. Don't let somebody else make the decision for you. Well said. We're going to lighten the mood a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about the Charlotte Hornets. The city's NBA team opened its season Wednesday night with a new logo, color scheme, and uh, a new name, but not really. I mean, this is kind of a throwback to the past. Um, Charlotteans remember from 1998 to 2002, the Hornets were here. Uh, on Wednesday night, they won 108 to 106, defeating the Milwaukee Bucks. Uh, it seemed to be a massive love affair, uh, for the most part, with fans coming back to the uh, Time Warner Cable Arena to, to watch the game. How long do you think this love affair will last? I think it'll last as long as the team wins. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It usually is that simple, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, the, the, the first game was a, a game for the ages, really. I mean, the uh, biggest comeback in, in team history. And, you know, there is a lot of nostalgia for people that have been here for a long time with the Hornets. I mean, a lot of good feelings back when they started. And, uh, you know, a lot of that's carrying it over. All right. That sounds good. Well, that's about all the time we have for this edition of Off the Record. Again, thanks to my guests for being here, Tom Bullock with WFAE, Jim Morrill with the Charlotte Observer, Jamie Bowl with WBTV News 3, and B. Thompson with WBAV. I'm Jeff Rivenbark. From all of us at WTVI PBS Charlotte, thank you for watching. And remember, be sure to get out and vote on Tuesday. Join us again next week. Have a good night. A production of WTVI-PBS Charlotte.